Investing legend gives dire warning. We're gonna go over some shocking information in this video. So sit down, buckle up. Definitely wanna pour yourself that stiff drink. This is gonna blow your mind. I'm gonna explain all of this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over the data from the 1970s. And I want to really challenge some of your preconceived notions. We're gonna set the stage and then we'll connect the dots in step number two and three. I've got four charts I want to go over. First, interest rates in the 1970s, the Fed funds rate, the DXY, which is the dollar against a basket of fiat currencies, global fiat currencies. We've got the CPI, the inflation rate in the United States, or at least what the United States government would admit to. <laughs> and then we've got real GDP. So that's nominal GDP adjusted for inflation. The first thing that everyone believes is if interest rates go up, the dollar automatically gets stronger. Well, let's look at the beginning of the 1970s. Interest rates went up to 14%. What happened to the dollar on the DXY? In other words, what happened to the dollar against that basket of foreign fiat currencies. It actually went down. Let's keep going. So many people believe that if CPI gets into double digits, the dollar will absolutely collapse and lose its reserve currency status. Maybe, but maybe not. In the early 1970s, we had the CPI up at 12, 13%. The dollar did go down but it only went down about as much as it did in 2020. Remember, in 2020, it went from about 100 down to 90 or 89. So a 10% decrease, very consistent with what we saw in the early 1970s. Then in the mid to late 1970s, when inflation went back up, the dollar went down slightly but it didn't collapse. We didn't lose reserve currency status. What you'll see if you look at charts going all the way back to the 1970s, you look at the 80s, the 90s, very often the inflation rate goes up while the dollar goes up. Sometimes inflation goes down while the dollar is going down. It's, it, there's not a real tight correlation between the rate of inflation that the government will admit to and the dollar on the DXY as measured against a basket of foreign currencies, mostly the Euro. So we've got to keep that in mind. The two aren't necessarily tied at the hip. Many people also believe that the only thing we need to do to control inflation is just to raise interest rates. But we raised interest rates twice before Volcker finally broke the back of inflation. Even when I thought of the 70s prior to doing this video, I always thought that the interest rates were just kind of low. The Fed kept them artificially low. Then finally, Volcker had the guts to come in and do something about it. Of course, that was partly true. But looking at this chart, we can see that they tried to break the back of inflation in the early 1970s and the late 1970s, and it was unsuccessful. They had to do it three times in order to get inflation down. I would also point out that when they got inflation down, it wasn't like it got down to zero, which is what most of us would like to see it. It only got down to maybe four or 5%. And then the late 80s, it got down to maybe 1%, but then in 1990, we're back up at six or 7%. That would be considered astronomically high inflation by today's standards. So I think it's especially important in today's world where MMT is becoming so popular, we remember that just because you raise interest rates doesn't necessarily mean you tame inflation. Once the inflation genie gets out of the bottle, very hard to get her back in. One thing I've noticed whenever I listen to mainstream economists or PhDs at the Fed is they always conflate inflation with economic growth. They use those two words synonymously to the point where if we just create inflation, 
Well, that has to mean the economy is booming, as if they're one and the same. But when we look at the 1970s, we see it's not true. Here, we had 12% inflation. But what happened to real GDP, which is what we should be concerned with? Who cares about nominal GDP? If that was important, then Venezuela would be the best economy in the world. Real GDP actually went down. So our economic output decreased while inflation was going parabolic. The exact same thing happened in the late 1970s where inflation goes up, but real GDP actually goes down. So just because we get inflation doesn't necessarily mean the economy is improving. The economy can get much, much worse regardless of what the inflation headline number actually reads. This highlights something I talk about all the time. We can have an economic depression while prices are going up. Just because we have a depression doesn't necessarily mean we're seeing deflation. We can have an inflationary depression as well. And the 1970s are a good example of that. So instead of getting hyper-focused on deflation or inflation, in my opinion, we should more so focus on the economic output of the private sector and the real economy, minus government spending. But the main thing I wanted to emphasize from step number one is the difference between the 1970s and today. In the 70s, the debt was very low. <laughs> today, it's the complete opposite. The debt is through the roof. Consumer debt, corporate debt, government debt, all at or near all-time highs. Also, back in the 1970s, our economy wasn't financialized like it is today. Now, our economy always needs asset prices going up or it starts to stagnate, if not implode. So back in the 1970s, we raised interest rates to solve our problems, but we didn't have the debt we didn't have all these asset bubbles. So today, much different. We can't come in and raise interest rates to solve our problems. That is no longer on the table. And I know right about now, your friend and family member Fred is saying, ah, oh, George, that's nonsense. You're just fear-mongering. The Fed can solve this problem. All they have to do is just let inflation run hot and that will take the stock market to all-time highs forever. If the stock market just keeps going up for the next 100 years, that solves all of our problems. We don't need to raise interest rates like they did in the 1970s. The Fed has this under control. <laughs> what I'd like to point out to Fred is back in the 1970s, the CPI, called the mid or early 1970s, CPI up at 14%. What happened to the stock market? From 1972 to 1974, the stock market went down by 50% in nominal terms. Let me reiterate, while the CPI was over 12%. So just because we have extremely high rates of inflation or the Fed lets inflation run hot doesn't mean that stock prices and housing prices won't go down even in nominal terms. Step number two, now we need to talk about yield curve control so we can put all the pieces of the puzzle together. And as soon as we go over this chart, I'm going to reveal the investing legend, and the dire warning he is giving all of us. But going back to step number one, even if today we have the same problems we experienced in the 1970s, we've got to come up with different solutions. Notice I have solutions <laughs> in quotes because these are their solutions not mine. So what do you do if you have an economy where prices are going up, therefore bond yields, interest rates are going up as well, but at a certain point, those interest rates will crush the economy 
because the economy is burdened with all this debt and it's built on asset bubbles continuing to increase over time. So if interest rates go up, the debt can't be serviced and asset prices come crashing down, collapsing the economy. This takes us straight to the yield curve. This is what it looked like in January of 2021. On the bottom, we go from a one month T-bill all the way to a 30 year treasury. On the left, we go from 0% interest rate <laughs> up to a whopping 2%. Can you imagine that? Starts off very flat, but once we get to the one year, it goes up just a little bit. And then once we get to two year, three year, it really starts to go up. Of course, relatively speaking, the 10 year treasury, which is very important for interest rates in the real economy in January was at 1.1% and it topped out the 30 year right around 1.8%. But what we have to try to figure out is how high interest rates can go on the 10 year before it gets into the no bueno zone. <laughs> and that's basically where those interest rates start to crush the economy. I talked about this yesterday with Luke Groman on my interview. If you haven't seen that, definitely check it out. We'll put a link in the description below. But at a certain point, these interest rates go high enough to where it crushes the economy and it crushes the stock market as well. We saw this back in 2018. So once interest rates get to a point where they start to negatively impact the economy, where something breaks, as Luke Groman describes it, the Fed most likely will come in and institute yield curve control. So how this is different from quantitative easing is quantitative easing, they'll just buy a set amount of treasuries from the primary dealer bank. So let's just call it 80 billion per month. With yield curve control, they would buy an unlimited amount of treasuries. They would buy however many they needed to buy in order to keep the interest rates below the no bueno zone so they wouldn't negatively impact the economy. This would allow your drunk, insolvent Uncle Sam to continue to spend money like a drunken sailor to deficit spend, the Fed comes in, monetizes the debt by creating more funny money, bank reserves. And this is the very beginning of MMT where the two balance sheets merge. And like I said in step number one, I think this is why they brought on Janet Yellen. And obviously this is Janet Yellen, but just in case you couldn't tell, I put her name right there to help you out. <laughs> But with the government coming in and making it rain on the real economy with stimmy checks or infrastructure spending or the Green New Deal, this is going to increase M2 money supply. Editor, go ahead and throw up a chart. And we can see in 2020, M2 money supply, in other words, the amount of currency units in the real economy chasing goods and services went parabolic. So the concern most pros have is if the Fed comes out and institutes yield curve control and inflation really starts to run hot, they're not going to be able to get the inflation genie back in the bottle. We saw this in all those charts going back to the 1970s. So if they institute yield curve control and the government continues to spend like they have to, to prop up the economy, how do they prevent severe inflation, if not hyperinflation. And this brings us to the dire warning from the investment legend himself. That is none other than Russell Napier. If you're not familiar with Russell, he is the pro that all the pros go to for advice and to really try to understand the economy better. If you talk to the pros like Luke Groman, Brent Johnson, Lynn Alden, They'll say there's a few individuals that they consider the top macro thinkers in the world. One is Dr. Lacey Hunt. Number two, not in any particular order, is Russell Napier. So he's given this a lot of thought. What is the solution? If they have to institute yield curve control, how do they also control inflation or try to control inflation? And this 
is where we get the dire warning. To understand what Russell thinks the future will look like for the United States economy, let's go right to a clip from a recent interview with my great buddy, Eric Townsend on Macro Voices. So everybody should try to war game being the authorities, the government or the central bank, trying to keep that yield curve down. How do you do that in this scenario? And what history shows us, because it's been done before, it involves a huge amount of manipulation of the economy and effectively slides the economy along the continuum from market economy towards command economy. Now, to be clear, it doesn't take you all the way to command economy. It just moves you towards command economy. Uh, Most people listening to this call have been operating in what has been, generally speaking, a market economy. And then you have to learn a whole new skill set as to how to invest money in something that's becoming much more akin to a command economy. Maybe we could call it capitalism with Chinese characteristics. But the history of financial repression has included all sorts of things that we've just forgotten about, which is the quantitative control of credit by government. Uh, Capital controls have been part of it. Rent controls have been part of it. Uh, High transaction taxes have been part of it. I mean, I could go on and on, but we've got to get into our heads that this is a fundamental structural transformation in how the financial and savings system works, taking it away from the market and more towards a, a, an area of government diktat down towards that command economy uh, end of the scale. Russell, there's at least one school of monetary policy thought that says that if you start to get inflation, you have to raise interest rates because otherwise the inflation can run away. And it's actually the interest rates that are the cure for the inflation. It sounds like what you're saying is we're expecting inflation. We know what the cure is, which is higher interest rates, but it's impossible to dole out that cure because the government can't afford to let that happen. Does that mean that we're headed toward the risk of runaway inflation? So it is correct that people believe that, but it is not correct to say that it's true. It is true in a market economy. And and absolutely, Eric, everything I've written in my career over 25 years would focus on that and say that's absolutely true. But that's only true if you live in a market economy. How would you control inflation in a world where you never raise interest rates and you never shrink the size of the central bank balance sheet? You and I would both say, well, actually, that's got to give us not just runaway inflation. That's got to give us hyperinflation. But I can tell you exactly how you would control the rate of inflation without ever doing either of those things, which is to control the rate of bank credit growth. Now, as it happens, I'm deep in the middle of reading a book about post-World War II French banking, and it is very clear that inflation was never controlled by interest rates. Now, you might say, well, that's why it got out of control. Uh, But actually, through the 50s and 60s, when certainly after a big dose of inflation from 45 to 48, inflation was moderate in France. But by controlling the supply of bank credit, they controlled the supply of money. In the modern system that you and I are used to, we've used interest rates to try and control the supply of bank credit and the supply of money. But it is possible to do it another way around. Now, why why don't we do that? Or why haven't we done that over the last 30 years? Because it was such a dreadful thing to do, because it ended up with us as the government or the central bank in cahoots pushing bank credit to our favoured little industries and our sometimes our favoured People as well, and we decided in the late 70s into the 80s that that was such a bad way to do things. We'd stop when it's back. Step number three, Russell Napier's dire warning explained. What he was talking about in that clip was the United States moving more towards a command economy. In other words, more central planning. And he used the example of China's version of capitalism. And many of you at home would say, okay, well, China's doing okay. I don't think it's that bad. But I want to point out that China started at an extremely low point. With pure communism, their entire country was very, very poor. And as they incorporated more capitalism and more free markets, more price signals, their economy has improved to what we see today. So let's just assume that now they have 50% free market capitalism or 50% capitalism, let's say. Or in the United States, if we go to that same point where the economy is driven by 50% of the government and 50% of the private sector, that will take us on a trajectory that's the complete opposite of China. They're going up meaning their standard of living is increasing, 
where our standard of living to get to the same point would decrease significantly. But back to the topic at hand. The main problem the central planners have is they need to continue to print money to prop up the economy artificially, but they can't afford to allow interest rates to go above a certain level, the yield curve control we talked about in step number two. So how do you prevent hyperinflation in this scenario? What you'd have to do is you'd have to control the lending of the commercial banking system. Why, you may ask yourself. Currently, and in the past, the commercial banking system is responsible for creating the majority of the money supply. So when you hear about M2 money supply or the Euro dollar system, that's the commercial banks inside and outside of the United States creating dollars out of thin air by creating loans and lending to institutions, individuals, and other countries. That's what Russell Napier was referring to when he was talking about the commercial banks creating credit. Credit is just another way to say they're creating loans or creating additional money supply. So how would they execute this game plan? And what would the net result be for the economy at large and all of you watching this video? Currently, or maybe in the past, <laughs> the way it's supposed to work in the United States, the Fed tries to manage the banking system or credit creation by lowering or raising interest rates. The bank issues the loans into the real economy. This creates additional M2 money supply. So the producers, the farmers, let's say in our simple economy, that are growing or raising <laughs> cows, wheat, and cotton, they get the loan from the bank, hopefully they're productive loans, and they create more supply of goods and services, which makes the real economy richer. This is the way free market capitalism is supposed to work if we have a central bank or the commercial banking system. Ideally, I would eliminate the central bank and just have the relationship between the bank and the producers and have them figure out the interest rates on their own. Go back to a system of free banking like we had in the early 1800s. But that's a completely separate video. But if the central planners are going to control the amount of money supply to prevent hyperinflation, if they're pegging the yield curve or with yield curve control, they're going to have to take control of this process of the credit creation from banks into the real economy. We transition into an economy where the commercial banking system is no longer in charge of credit creation. They're no longer in charge of creating additional money supply or extending loans. If we remove the commercial banks from the equation and we put the government in charge, all of a sudden there's no incentives to lend money to producers who will create more goods and services that make society as a whole richer. The incentives for new money creation go from production to the Cantillon effect. And that's a completely separate video. But a short version of the Cantillon effect is that new money creation goes to the people who are closest, the insiders. So the political insiders like Klaus, with the World Economic Forum, the financial insiders like Jamie Dimon, they're the ones who are getting all of the new money that's coming from the government, but they're not producing anything. I would argue that money going to them first is actually reducing goods and services in the real economy. It's making us poorer. And the only money supply that's now going to the individuals in the real economy the producers that were growing cotton, wheat, and cows up here, now they're just sitting at home producing nothing, collecting their stimmy checks along with Moody the Millennial. So if you're someone that believes the path to a richer society is free market capitalism, you have to come to the conclusion, if we transition from this model where banks are creating credit growth for production of goods and services, 
to a system where the government is controlling the additional money supply based on whoever has the most political pull. And then they're making up the lack of production by sending stimulus checks to those individuals in the real economy, which increases the wealth gap. You have to believe that the future for the United States, although we might be able to control inflation to a certain degree, the central planners might be able to institute yield curve control. That might fix a few things, but the bigger problem of society becoming poorer will still remain. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here, and I will see you on the next video.